Chapter 32 Nobody knows how long it takes for thoughts to form. People talk about electrical impulses racing through nerves at a substantial fraction of the speed of light. But that's mere transmission. That's mail delivery. The letter is written in the brain, sparked to life by some sudden damn chemical reaction. Two compounds arcing across synapses and reacting like lead and acid in an automobile battery. But instead of sending 12 dumb volts to a turn signal, the brain floods the body with all kinds of subtle adjustments all at once. Because thoughts don't necessarily happen one at a time. They come in starbursts and waterfalls and explosions. And they race away on parallel tracks. Jostling, competing, fighting for supremacy. Risha saw the dark blue Chevrolet and instantly linked it through Vincent's testimony back at the motel to the two men he had seen from Dorothy Coast Barn. While simultaneously critiquing the connection. In that Chevrolets were very common cars, and dark blue was a very common color. While simultaneously recalling the two matched Iranians and the two matched Arabs he had seen, and asking himself whether the rendezvous of two separate pairs of strange men in winter in a Nebraska hotel could be just a coincidence. And if indeed it wasn't, whether it might then reasonably imply the presence of a third pair of men, which might or might not be the two tough guys from Dorothy's farm. However inexplicable those six men's association might be, however mysterious their purpose, while simultaneously watching the man in front of him dropping his car key and moving his arm and putting his hand in his coat pocket, while simultaneously realizing that the guys he had seen on Dorothy's farm had not been staying at Vincent's motel and that there was nowhere else to stay except right there, 60 miles south at the Marriott, which meant that the Chevrolet was likely theirs, at least within the bounds of a reasonable possibility, which meant that the Iranian with the moving arm was likely connected with them in some way, which made the guy an enemy. Although Risha had no idea how or why, while simultaneously knowing that likely didn't mean shit in terms of civilian jurisprudence. While simultaneously recalling years of hard-won experience that told him men like this Iranian went for their pockets in dark parking lots for one of only four reasons either to pull out a cell phone, to call for help, or to pull out a wallet, or a passport, or an ID, to prove their innocence, or their authority, or to pull out a knife, or to pull out a gun. Risha knew all that, while also knowing that. Violent reaction, ahead of the first two reasons, would be inexcusable. But that violent reaction, ahead of the latter two reasons, would be the only way to save his life. Starbursts and waterfalls and explosions of thoughts. All jostling and competing and fighting for supremacy. Better safe than sorry, Risha reacted. He twisted from the waist in a violent spasm and started a low sidearm punch aimed at the center of the Iranian's chest. Chemical reaction in his brain, instantaneous transmission of the impulse. Chemical reaction in every muscle system, from his left foot to his right fist. Total elapsed time, a small fraction of a second. Total distance to target less than a yard. Total time to target another small fraction of a second which was good to know right then. Because the guy's hand was all the way in his pocket, by that point, his own nervous system 
reacting just as fast as Rishas. His elbow jerking up and back and trying to free whatever the hell it was he wanted. Be it a knife or a gun or a phone or a driver's license or a passport or a government ID or a perfectly innocent letter from the University of Tehran proving he was a world expert on plant genetics and an honor guest in Nebraska. Just days away from increasing local profits a hundredfold and eliminating world hunger at one fell swoop. But right or wrong, Risha's fist was homing in regardless. And the guy's eyes were going wide and panicked in the gloom. And his arm was jerking horror. And the brown skin and the black hair on the back of his moving hand was showing above the hem of his pocket. And then came his knuckles, all five of them bunch, and nodded. Because his fingers were clamping hard around something big and black. Then Reach's blow landed. Two hundred and fifty pounds of moving mass, a huge fist, a huge impact. The zipper of the guy's coat driving backward into his breastbone. His breastbone, driving backward into his chest cavity. The natural elasticity of his rictic, letting it yield whole inches. The resulting violent compression, driving the air from his lungs. The hydrostatic shock, driving blood back into his heart. His head snapping forward, like a crash test dummy. The shoulders driving backward. His weight coming up off the ground. His head whipping backward again. And hitting a plate glass window behind him with a dull boom like a kettle drum. His arms and legs and torso all going down like a rag doll. His body falling, sprawling the hard polycarbonate click. And clatter of something black scaring away on the ground. Risha tracking it all the way in the corner of his eye. Not a wallet, not a phone, not a knife. But a Glock 17 semi-automatic pistol, all dark and boxy and wicked. It ended up six or eight feet away from the guy. Completely out of his reach, safe, not retrievable. Partly because of the distance itself, and partly because the guy was down, and he wasn't moving at all. In fact, he was looking like he might never move again. Something Rishi had heard about, but never actually seen. His army medic friends had called it Comotio Cordis, their name for low-energy trauma, to the chest wall. Low-energy only in the sense that the damage wasn't done by a car wreck or a shotgun blast. But by a line drive in baseball, or a football collision, or a punch in the fight, or a bad fall onto a blonde object. Gruesome research on laboratory animals proved it was all about luck and timing. Electrocardiograms showed waveforms associated with a beating of the heart one of which was called the T-wave. And the experiments showed that, if the blow landed, when the T-wave was between 15 and 30 milliseconds short of its peak, then lethal cardiac dust rhythmia could occur, stopping the heart just like a regular heart attack. And in a high-stress environment, like a confrontation in a parking lot, the guy's heart was pounding away much harder than normal. And therefore, it was bringing those T-wave peaks around much faster than usual. As many as two, or possibly three times a second. Thereby dramatically increasing the odds that the luck and the timing would be bad, not good. The Iranian lay completely still, not breathing. No visible pulse, no signs of life. The standard first aid remedies caught by the army medics 
were artificial respiration and external chest compressions. 80 beats a minute, as long as it took. But Reach's personal rule of thumb was never to revive a guy who had just pulled a gun on him. He was fairly inflexible on the matter. So he let nature take its course for a minute. And then he helped it along a little with heavy pressure from his finger. And thumb on the big arteries in the guy's neck. Four minutes without oxygen to the brain was reckoned to be the practical limit. Rishi gave it five, just to be certain. Squatting there, looking around, listening hard. No one reacted, no one came. The Iranian died. The slack tensions of deep unconsciousness fading away. The absolute soft limpness of recent death replacing them. Rishi stood up and found the car key and picked up the Glock. That key was marked with a Chevrolet stove bolt lower, but it wasn't for the blue car. Risha stabbed the unlock button, and nothing happened. The Glock was close to new, and fully loaded. 17 brain 9mm parabolums in the magazine, and one in the chamber. Risha put it in his pocket with his screwdrivers. He walked back to the front lot, and tried again with a key. The yellow Chevy Malibu answer him. It flashed all four of its turn signals and unlocked all four of its doors. It was new and plain and clean, an obvious rental. He got in and pushed the seat back and started it up. The tank was close to full. There were rental papers in the door pocket. Ate it that day and made out to a Las Vegas corporation under a name that communicated nothing. There were bottles of water in the cup holders, one part use, one unopened. To reach it backed out of the slot and drove around to the back of the H and stopped with a dead guy between the wall and the car. He found the remote button and popped the trunk. He got up and checked the space. It was not a very big opening, and not a very big trunk. But then, the Iranian was not a very big guy. Richard bent down, and went through the Iranian's pockets. He found a phone, and a knife, and a wallet, and a handkerchief, and about a dollar in coins. He left the coins, and stripped the battery out of the phone and put the battery back in one of the dead guy's pockets, and the rest of the phone in another. The knife was a switchblade with a pearl handle. Heavy, solid, and sharp. The decent implement. He put it in his own pocket, with his adjustable wrench. He checked the wallet. It held close to four hundred bucks in cash, plus three credit cards plus a driver's license from the state of Nevada. May out to a guy named Asker Radsafer at a Las Vegas address. The photograph was plausible. The credit cards were in the same name. The cash was mostly 20s, crisp and fresh and fragrant, straight from an ATM. Reese kept the cash and wiped the wallet with the handkerchief and put it back in the dead guy's pocket. Then he hoisted him up, who hands, collar, and belt, and turned and made ready to fold him into the yellow Malibu's trunk. Then he stopped. He got a better idea. He carried the guy over to Seth Duncan's Cadillac and laid him gently on the ground. He found the Cadillac key in his pocket, and opened the trunk, and picked the guy up again, and put him inside. An old-fashioned turnpike cruiser. A big trunk, plenty of space. He closed the lid on the guy. He opened the driver's door, and used the handkerchief, to wipe everything he had touched that day. The wheel, the gear shift, the mirror. 
the radio knobs, the door handles inside and out. Then he blipped the remote and locked up again and walked away back to the Malibu. It was yellow, but apart from that, it was fairly anonymous. Domestic brand local plates, conventional shape. Probably less conspicuous how on the open road than the Cadillac, despite the garish color. And probably less likely to be reported stolen. Out of state guys, with guns and knives in their pockets, generally kept a lot quieter than outraged local citizens. He checked left, check right, check behind, check to head. All quiet. Just cold air and silence and stillness and a night mist falling. He got back in the Malibu and kept the headlights off. And turned her on and nosed slowly out of the lot. He drove the length of McNally Street and paused. To the left was I-80, 60 miles south. A fast six-lane highway, a straight shot east all the way to Virginia. To the right were the Forty Farms and the Duncans and the Apollo Inn and Eleanor and the doctor and his wife and Dorothy Cole, all of them 60 miles north. Decision time. Left or right? South or north? He flicked the headlights on and turned right and headed back north. Chapter 33 The Duncans had moved from Jonas Duncan's kitchen to Jasper's because Jasper still had a mostly full bottle of Knob Creek in his cupboard. All four men were around the table, elbow to elbow. Amber half inches of bourbon in thick shaped glasses set out in front of them. They were sipping slow and talking low. Their latest shipment was somewhere between 12 and 24 hours away. Usually a time for celebration, like the night before Christmas. But this time they were a little subdued. Where do you suppose it is right now? Parked up for the night. At least I hope so. Close to the border, but waiting for daylight. Prudence is the key now. Five hundred miles. Crossing time plus ten hours, maybe. Plus contingencies. How long do you suppose it takes to read a police file? Good question. I've been getting it a little thought, naturally. It must be a very big file. And it must be stored away somewhere. Let's say government workers start at nine in the morning. Let's say they quit at five. Let's say there's some measure of the bureaucracy involved in gaining access to the file. So let's say noon tomorrow would be a practical starting point. That would give him five hours tomorrow, and maybe the full eight on the day after. That might be enough. So he won't come back for 48 hours at least. Well, I'm only guessing. I can't be sure. Even so, we'll have plenty of margin. He won't come back at all, why would he? A hundred people read that file and said there was nothing wrong with it. And this guy isn't a hundred times smarter than anyone else. He can't be. Nobody spoke. What? He doesn't have to be smarter than anyone else, son. Certainly not a hundred times smarter. He just has to be smart in a different way. Lateral is what they call it. But there's no evidence. We all know that. I agree, but that's the damn point. It's not about what's in the file. It's about what isn't in the file. The Malibu was like half a Cadillac. Four cylinders instead of eight. One ton instead of two, and about half as long. But it worked okay. It was cruising nicely. Not that Risha was paying much attention to it. 
he was thinking about the dead Iranian. And the odds against hitting a T-wave window. The guy had been small, built like a bird. And Risha tended to assume that people opposite him on the physical spectrum were also opposite him on the personality spectrum. So that, in place of his own placid nature, he imagined the guy was all strung out and nervous. Which might have meant that back there in the parking lot, the guy's heart was going as fast as 180 beats a minute. Which meant those T-waves were coming around fast and furious three times a second. Which meant that the odds of hitting one of those crucial 15 millisecond windows ahead of a peak were about 45 in a thousand or a little better than 1 in 20. Unlucky for the Iranian, certainly, but no cause for major regret. Most likely, Risha would have had to put him down anyway, one way or another. Sooner or later, probably within just a few more heartbeats, it would have been practically inevitable. Once a gun was pulled, there were very few other available options. But still, it had been a first. And a last, probably, at least for a spell. Because Richie was pretty sure the next guy he met would be a football player. He figured the Duncans knew he had gone out of town, possibly for a day, possibly forever. He figured they would have gotten hold of the doctor long ago and squeezed that news out of him. And they were realistic, but cautious people. They would have stood down, five of their boys, for the night. And left just one lone sentry to the south. And that one lone sentry would have to be dealt with. But not via Pumo Teal Cordes. Risha wasn't about to aim a wild punch at a Cornhuster center mass. Not in this lifetime. You would break his head. He kept the Malib humming along. Eight miles, nine. And then he started looking ahead for the bar he had seen on the shoulder. The small wooden building. The cell block. Maybe just outside the city limit unincorporated land. Maybe a question of licensing or regulation. There was mist in the air and the Malibus had lights made crisp little tunnels. Then they were answered by a glow in the air. A halo far ahead on the lush. Neon in Kelly green and red and blue. Beer signs. Plus yellow tungsten from a couple of token spots in the parking lot. Reach a slow and pulled in and parked his yellow car next to a pickup that was mostly brown with corrosion. He got out and locked up and headed for the door. From close up, the place looked nothing at all, like a prison. It was just a shack. It could once have been a house or a store. Even the sign was written wrong. The word cell block were stenciled like a notation on an electrician's blueprint. Like something technological. There was noise inside, the warm low hubbub. And who hawk of a half empty late evening bark and full swing. Plus a little music under it. Probably from a jukebox. A tune Risha didn't recognize, but was prepared to like. He went in. The door opened directly in the left front corner of the main public room. The bar ran front to back on the right, and there were tables and chairs on the left. There were maybe twenty people in the room, mostly men. The decoration scheme was really no scheme at all. Wooden tables, Wheeled back chairs, bar stools, bore floor. There was no prison theme. In fact, the electronic visuals from outside were continued inside. The stenciled word cell block were repeated on the bar back. 
flanked by foil, hover cutouts of radio towers with lightning bolts coming out of them. Reach threaded sideways between tables and caught the barman's eye. And the barman shuffled left to meet him. The guy was young, and his face was open and friendly. You look confused. I guess I was expecting bars on the windows, maybe booths in the old cells. I thought maybe you would be wearing a suit with arrows all over it. The guy didn't answer. Like an old prison. Like a cell block. The guy stayed blank for a second, and then he smiled. Not that kind of cell block. Take out your phone. I don't have a phone. Well, if you did, you'd find it wouldn't work here, no signal. There's a null zone about a mile wide. That's why people come here for a little undisturbed peace and quiet. It can't just not answer. Human nature doesn't really work that way, does it? People can't ignore a ringing phone. It's about guilty consciences, you know, wives or bosses. All kinds of hassle. Better that their phones don't ring at all. So, do you have a play phone here? Strictly for emergencies. The guy pointed. Back quarter. Thanks. That's why I came in. He threaded down the line of stools. Some of them occupied, some of them not. And he found an opening that led to the restrooms and the rear door. There was a payphone on the wall, opposite the ladies' room. It was mounted on a cork rectangle that was dark and stained with age, and marked with scribbled numbers in faded ink. He checked his pockets for quarters and found five. He wished he had kept the Iranian's coins. He dialed the same number he had used a quarter of an hour ago. And Dorothy Co. had used a quarter of a century ago. The call was answered, and he asked for Hogue. And he was connected inside ten short seconds. One more favor. You got phone books for the whole county, right? Yes. I need a number for a guy called Seth Duncan. About sixty miles north of you. Way one. Reese heard the click and patter of a keyboard. A computer database, not a paper book. That's an unlisted number. Unlisted as in you don't have it, or as in you can see it, but you won't tell me. Unlisted as in please don't ask me, because you'll be putting me on the spot. Okay, I won't ask you. Anything under Eleanor Duncan? No, there are for Duncan's all male names, all unlisted. So give me the doctor instead. What doctor? The local guy up there. What's his name? I don't know. I don't have his name. Then I can't help you. This thing is purely alphabetical by last name. It's going to say Smith, Dr. Bilk, or whatever. Something like that, in very small letters. Got to be a contact number for a doctor. There might be an emergency. Got to be some way of getting hold of the guy. I don't see anything. Wait, I know how. Give me the Apollo in. The Apollo like the space rocket. Exactly like the space rocket. The keyboard pattered, and Hogue read out a number. A 308 area code for the western part of the state, and then seven more digits. Reacher repeated them once in his head, and said, thanks, and hung up and redial. Ten miles south, my Ines man was dialing too, calling home. He got Mahini on his cell, and said, We have a problem. Specifically, 
Answer is right on us. Impossible. Well, yes, I sent him down to the car to give me a bottle of water. He didn't come back, so I checked. The car is gone, and he's gone too. Call him. I tried ten times. His phone is off. I'll delete it. What do you want me to do? I want you to find him. I have no idea where to look. He drinks, you know. I know, but there's no bar in town, just a liquor store. And it will be closed by now. And he wouldn't have driven to the liquor store anyway. He would have walked, it's only about three blocks away. There must be a bar, this is America. Ask the concierge. There is no concierge, this isn't the Bellagio. They don't even put wire in the rooms. There must be someone at the desk. Ask him. I can't go anywhere. I don't have a car. And I can't ask the others for help. Not now. That would be an admission of weakness. Find a way, find a bar, and find a way of getting there. That's an order. Reach and listen to the ringtone. It was loud and sonorous and resonant in his ear the product of a big old-fashioned earpiece. Maybe an inch and a half across, buried deep inside. A big old-fashioned plastic handset that probably weighed a pound. He pictured the two phones ringing in the motel 50 miles north. One at the desk, one behind the bar. Or maybe there were more than two phones. Maybe there was a third extension in a back office and a fourth in Vincent's private quarters. Maybe the whole place was a regular rat's nest of wiring, just like the inside of a lunar module. But however many phones there were, they all rang for a long period. And then one of them was answered. Vincent came on and said, This is the Apollo N. Just like Risha had heard him said it before very brightly and enthusiastically, like it was a brand new establishment. Taking its first ever call on its first ever night in business. I need Eleanor Duncan's phone number. Richard, where are you? Still out of town. I need Eleanor's number. Or are you coming back? What could possibly keep me away? Were you not going to Virginia? Eventually, I hope. Uh, I don't have Eleanor's number. Isn't she on the phone tree? No, how could she be, Seth, my answer? Okay, is the doctor there? Not right now. So, Nate, then? Unfortunately. Do you have his number? Hold the line. There was a thump as he put the handset down, maybe on the bar. And then a pause, just about long enough for him to walk across the lounge. And then the sound of a second handset being raised, maybe at the desk. The two open lines picked up on each other. And Richard heard the room's slow echo hissing and bouncing off the round domed ceiling. Vincent read out a number, the area code, and seven more digits. Reacher repeated them once in his head, and said, thanks, and hung up and redal. The guy at the Marriott's desk told Martini's man that, yes, there was a bar. Not exactly in town, but ten miles north, just outside the city limit. On the left shoulder of the Tulane, called the cell block. A pleasant place, reasonably pressed. And that yes, it was usually open late. And that yes, there was a taxi service in town. And that yes, he would be happy to call a cab immediately. And so, less than five minutes later, Mahini's man was sliding across 
stained vinyl, into the rear seat of an ancient Chevy Caprice. And the driver was pulling out of the lot and heading down McNally Street and making the right at the end. The doctor answered a lot faster than Vincent had. I need Eleanor Duncan's phone number. Hey, Richard, where are you? Still out of town. Hey, are you coming back? What are you missing me? I didn't tell the Duncans about the Cadillac. Good man. Has Seth gone home yet? He was still with his father when I left. Well, he's dead. People say he often does. You okay? Not too bad. I was in the truck. The Quarasters got me. Then? Nothing mushy. Just words. Really. Reach a picture of the guy. Maybe standing in his hallway or his kitchen. Quaking, shaking, watching the windows, checking the doors. Or are you sober? A little. A little? That's about as good as it gets these days, I'm afraid. I need Eleanor Duncan's number. She's not listed. I know that. She's not on the phone tree. But she's your patient. Hey, I can't. How much more trouble could you be in? It's not just that. There are confidentiality issues, too. I'm a doctor. Like you said, I talk an oath. We're making an omelet here. We're going to have to break some eggs. And don't know it came from me. If it comes to it, I'll tell them different. The doctor went quiet, and then he sighed, and then he recited a number. Thanks, Risha said. Take care. Best to your wife. He hung up and read aisle and listened to yet more ringtone. The same languid, electronic purr. But this time from a different place. From somewhere inside the restored farmhouse. Among the pastel colors and the fancy rugs and the oil paintings. He figured that if Seth was home, then Seth would answer. It seemed to be that kind of a relationship. But he'd bet himself a buck. Seth wasn't home. The Duncans were in two kinds of trouble. And Risha's experience told him they would huddle together until it passed. So Eleanor was probably home alone and would pick up or not. Maybe she would just ignore the bell. Whatever the barman thirty feet away thought about human nature. She pick up. Hello. Is Seth there? Richard. Where are you? Doesn't matter where I am. Where's Seth? He's at his father's. I don't expect him home tonight. That's good. You still up and dress? Why? I want you to do something for me. Chapter 34 The old Caprice's weir bench was contoured, like tools separate bucket seats. Not by design, but by age. And relentless wear and care. Mamini's man settled into the right-hand pit, behind the front passenger seat, and cocked his head to the left, so he could see out the windshield. He saw the blank back of a billboard and the headlight beams. And then he saw nothing. The road ahead was straight and empty, no oncoming lights, which was a disappointment. One drink on Axer's part might be overlooked. Or even two or three, followed by a prompt return. But a night of it would be considered desertion. The wheezing old motor had the needle trembling over the sixty mark. A mile a minute, 
Nine more miles to go. Nine minutes. Risha said. Exactly one hour and ten minutes from now. I want you to take a drive in your little red sports car. A drive? Well. South on the two lane. This drive, eleven miles, as fast as you want. Then turn around and go home again. Eleven miles. Per qual, or more, but not less than ten. Why? Doesn't matter why. Will you do it? Are you going to do something to the house? You want me out of the way? I won't come near the house. I promise. No one will ever know. Will you do it? I can. Seth took my car key. I'm grounded. Is there a spare? He took that too. He's not carrying them around in his pocket. Not if he keeps his own key in a bowl in the kitchen. Eleanor said, "Nothing." Do you know where they are? Yes, they're on his desk. Aunt Borin. Aunt, just sitting there, like a test for me. He says obedience without temptation is meaningless. Why the hell are you still there? Where else could I go? Just take the damn keys, will you? Stand up for yourself. Will this hurt, Seth? I don't know how you want me to answer that question. I want you to answer it honestly. It might hurt him, indirectly, and eventually, possibly. There was a long pause. Then Eleanor said, "Okay, I'll do it." I'll drive south eleven miles on the toll lane and come back again. An hour and ten minutes from now. No, an hour and six minutes from now. We've just been talking for four minutes. He hung up and stepped back to the main public room. The barman was working like a good barman should, using fast, efficient movements. Thinking ahead, watching the room, he caught Richard's eye. Then Richard decoyed towards him, and the guy said, "I should think you'd sign a napkin or something. I come in Manta. You're the only guy who ever came in here to use a phone, not avoid one. You want a drink?" Richard scanned what the guy had to offer. Liquor of all kinds, beer on tap, beer in bottles. Sodas. No sign of coffee. No thanks. I'm good. I should hit the road. He moved on, shuffling sideways between the tables. And he pushed out the door, and walked back to his car. He got in, started up, backed out, and drove away north. Mahini's man saw a glow in the air far ahead on the left. Neon, green, and red, and blue. The driver kept his foot down for a minute more, and then he lifted off and coasted. The engine coughed, and the exhaust popped, and sputtered, and the taxi slowed. Way far up the road, in the distance, were a pair of red tail lights, very faint and far away, almost not there at all. The taxi brake. Mahini Snan saw the bar. Just a simple wooden building. There were two weak spotlights under the eaves at the front. They threw full pools of token light into the lot. There were plenty of parked vehicles, but no yellow rental. The taxi pulled in and stopped. The driver looked back over his shoulder. Mahini's man said, "Wait for me." How long? A minute. Mahini's man got out and stood still. The tail lights in the north had disappeared. Mahini's man watched the darkness where they had been, just for a second. 
Then he walked to the wooden building's door. He entered. He saw a large room, with chairs and tables on the left, and a bar on the right. There were about twenty customers in the room. Mostly men, none of them, asked her as a fair. There was a barman behind the bar serving a customer. Lining up the next, glancing over at the new arrival. Mahingi's man threaded between the tables towards him. He felt that everyone was watching him. A small man, foreign, unshaven, rumpled, and not very clean. The barman's customer peeled away. Holding two foaming glasses of beer. The barman moved on to the next customer serving him. But glancing beyond him, for the next in line. As if he was planning to move ahead. I'm looking for someone. I guess we are, sir. That's the very essence of human nature, isn't it? It's an eternal quest. No, I'm looking for someone I know. A friend of mine. A lady or a gentleman. He looks like me. Then I haven't seen him. I'm sorry. He has a yellow car. Cars are outside. I'm inside. My Kingese man turned and scanned the room and thought about the red tail lights in the north and turned back and asked, Are you sure? I don't want to be rude, sir. But really, if two of you had been in here tonight, someone would have called Homeland Security already, don't you think? My Kingese man said nothing. Just saying, this is Nebraska. There are military installations here. Then was someone else just here? This is a bar, my friend. People are in and out all night long. That's kind of the point of the place. The barman turned back to his current customer. Interaction over. My heinous man turned and scanned the room one more time. Then he gave it up and moved away between the tables back to the door. He stepped into the lot and took out his phone. No signal. He stood still for a second and glanced north at where the red lights had gone. And then he climbed back into the taxi. He closed the door against a yielding hinge and said, Thank you for waiting. The driver looked back over his shoulder and asked, where to now? Let me think about that for a minute. Richard kept the Malibu at a steady 60, a mile a minute. Hypnotic, power line pulse flashed past. The tire sang, the motor hummed. Richard took the fresh bottle of water from the cup holder and opened it. And drank from it one-handed. He switched his headlights to bright. Nothing to see ahead of him. A straight road, then mist, then darkness. He checked the mirror, nothing to see behind him. He checked the dials and the gauges, all good. Eleanor Duncan checked her watch. It was a small Rolex, a present from Seth, but probably real. She had counted ahead an hour and six minutes from when she had hung up the phone. And she had 45 minutes still to go. She stepped out of the living room into the hallway. And stepped out of the hallway into her husband's den. It was a small square space. She had no idea of its original purpose. Maybe a gun room. Now it was set up as a home office. But with an emphasis on gentlemanly style. Not clerical function. There was a club chair made of leather. The desk was you. There were bookshelves. There was a rug. The air in the room smelled like Seth. There's a shallow glass bowl on the desk. From Reno, near Venice, in Italy. It was green, a souvenir. It had paper coats in it, and her car keys just sitting there. 
two small serrated lances with big black heads for her Mazda Miata. A tiny red Duke seat convertible, a fun car, carefree, like the old British MGs and notices used to be, but reliable. She took one of the keys. She stepped back to the hallway. Eleven miles, she thought. She knew what Risha had in mind. So she opened the coat closet and put out a silk head scarf, pure white. She folded it into a triangle and tied it over her hair. She checked the mirror, just like an old-fashioned movie star. Or an old-fashioned movie star, after a knockout round, with an old-fashioned heavyweight champion. She left by the back door and walked through the cold to the garage. Seth's empty bay to the right, hers in the middle, the doors all open. She got in her car and unlatched the clips above the windshield and dropped the top. She started up and backed out and turned and waited on the driveway. The motor running, the heat warming, their heart being hard. She checked her watch, 29 minutes to go. Risha cruised onward 60 miles an hour. Three more minutes. And then he slowed down and put his lights back on bright. He watched the right shoulder. The old abandoned roadhouse loomed up at him right on cue. Pinned and stark in his headlight beams. The bat roof, the beer signs on the wharves behind the muck. The blues are all around, where cars at once parked. He pulled off the road and into the lot. Loose stones pop and crunch and slither under his tires. He drove a full circuit. The building was long and low and plain, like a barn cut off at the knees. Rectangular, except for two separate square bump outs. Added at the back one at each end of the structure. The first for restrooms, probably, and the second for a kitchen. Efficient in terms of plumbing lines. Between the bump outs was a shallow, E-shaped space. Like a bait empty apart from a little wind-blown trash. And closed on three sides, open only to the dark empty fields to the east. It was maybe 30 feet long and 12 feet deep. Perfect for later. Risha came back around to the south gable wall and parked 30 feet from it. Out of sight from the north, facing the road at a slight diagonal angle, like a cop on speed trap duty. He killed the lights and kept the motor running. He got out into the cold and looped around the hood and walked to the corner of the building. He leaned on the old boards. They felt thin and vain, frozen by a hundred winters, baked by a hundred summers. They smelled of dust and age. He watched the darkness in the north, where he knew the road must be. He waited. Chapter 35 Risha waited twenty long minutes, and then he saw light in the north. Very faint, maybe five or six miles away. Really just a high hemisphere gold in the mist, trembling a little. Bouncing, weakening, and strengthening, and weakening again. A moving bubble of light, very white, almost blue. A car coming south towards him. Pretty fast. Eleanor Duncan, presumably, right on time. Reach waited. Two minutes later, she was two miles closer. And the high hemispherical glow was bigger and stronger. Still bouncing, still trembling. But now it had a strange asynchronous pulse inside it. The bouncing now going two ways at once. The strengthening and the weakening now random and out of phase. There were two cars on the road, 
not one. Richard smiled. The sentry, the football player, posted to the south. A college graduate, not a dumb guy. He knew his five buddies had been sent home to bed because absolutely nothing was going to happen. He knew he had been posted as a precaution only, just for the sake of it. He knew he was facing a long night of boredom, staring into the dark, no chance of glory. So it's a guy going to do. When Eleanor Duncan suddenly blasts past him from behind in her little red sports car, He's going to see major brawny points on the table. That's what. He's going to give up on the blank hours ahead. And he's going to pull up and follow her. And he's going to dream of a promotion to the inner circle. And he's going to imagine a scene. And he's going to rehearse a speech. Because he's gonna to pull Seth Duncan aside tomorrow, first thing in the morning very discreetly, like an old friend or a trusted aide. And he's going to whisper, Yes, sir. I followed her all the way, and I can show you exactly where she went. Then he's going to act. No, sir. I told no one else. But I thought you should know. Then he's going to hop and shuffle in a modest and self-deprecating way. And he's going to say, Well, yes, sir. I thought it was much more important than sentry duty. And I am glad you agreed I did the right thing. Risha smiled again, human nature. Risha waited two more minutes. And the traveling bubble of light was another two miles closer. Now much flatter and more elongated. Two cars, with some little distance between them. Predator and Preck, some hundreds of yards apart. There was no red gold in the bubble. The football players' headlights were falling short of the Mazda's paint. The guy was maybe a quarter of a mile back, following the master stale lights. No doubt thinking, he was doing a hell of a job of staying inconspicuous. Maybe not such a smart guy. The Mazda had a mirror. An halogen headlights on a Nebraska winter night were probably visible from outer space. Risha moved. He pushed off the corner of the building and looped around the Malibu hood and got in the driver's seat. He locked the selector in first gear and put his left foot hard on the brake and his right foot on the gas. He goosed the paddle until the transmission was straining against the brake. And the whole car was one up tight and ready to launch. He kept one hand on the wheel and the other on the headlight switch. He waited. Sixty seconds. Ninety seconds. Then the Mazda flashed past, right to left instantaneously. A tiny dark shape, chasing a huge glow of bright light. It's top down, a woman in a headscarf at the wheel. All chased and turned by tire roar and engine noise, and the red flare of tail lights. Then it was gone. Risha counted one, and flicked his headlights on and took his foot off the brake and stamped on the gas and shot forward and braked car and stopped again sideways across the crown of the road. He wrenched open the door and spilled out and danced back towards the Malibus trunk towards the shoulder he had just left. Two hundred yards to his right, a big SUV was starting, a panic stop. Its headlights flared yellow against the Malibus paint. And then the nose dived into the black top. As the truck's front suspension crushed under the force of violent braking. Huge tires howled. 
and the truck lost its line and slid to its white and went into a full wheel slide and its near side wheels cocked under and its high center of gravity dipped over and its off side wheels came up in the air. Then they crashed back to earth and the rear end fishtail violently a full 90 degrees and the truck snapped around and came to rest parallel with the Malibu, less than ten feet away. Stall out and silent, the scream of stressed rubber dying away. Thin drifts of moving blue smoke following it and catching it, and stopping. And rising all around it, and billowing away into the cold night air. Reacher pulled the Iranian's lock from his pocket. And stormed the driver's door, and wrenched it open, and danced back, and pointed the gun. In general, he was not a big fan of dramatic arrests. But he knew from long experience what worked, and what didn't. With shocked and unpredictable subjects. So he screamed. Get out of the car! Get out of the car! Get out of the car! As loud as he could which was plenty loud. And the guy behind the wheel more or less tumbled out. And then Risha was on him, forcing him down, flipping him, jamming him face down into the black top, his knee in the small of the guy's back, the glock's muzzle heart in the back of the guy's neck, all the time screaming, Stay down, stay down, stay down. All the while, watching the sky over his shoulder for more lights. There were no more lights. No one else was coming. No backup. The guy hadn't called it in. He was planning a solo enterprise. All the glory for himself, as expected. Risha smiled. Human nature. The scene went quiet. Nothing to hear. Except the Malibu stage title. Nothing to see, except fall high beams, stabbing the far shoulder. The air was full of the smell of burned rubber, and hot brakes, and gas, and oil. The corn husker lay completely still. Hard not to, with 250 pounds on his back. And a gun to his head, and television images of SWAT arrests in his mind. Maybe real images. Country boys get arrested from time to time, the same as anyone else. And things that happen fast. All bark and noise and blur and panic. Enough that maybe the guy hadn't really seen Risha's face yet. Or recognized his description from the Duncan's warnings. Maybe the guy hadn't put two and two together. Maybe he was waiting it out, like a civilian. Waiting to explain to a cop that he was innocent, like people do. Which gave Richard a minor problem. He was about to transition away. From what the guy might have taken, be a legitimate law enforcement ticked on. Straight to what the guy was going to know for sure, was a wholly illegitimate kidnap attempt. And the guy was big, 6'6", six, six, or a little more. 290, or a little more. He had on a large red football jacket and baggy jeans. His feet were the size of boats. Risha said, Tell me your name. The guy's shin and his lips and his nose were all jammed hard down on the blacktop. John. Like a gasp, like a grunt. Just a soft expulsion of breath. Quiet and indistinct. Not bright. No. That's good. Reacha shifted his weight, turned the guy's head, jammed the clock in his ear, saw the whites of his eyes. Do you know who I am? 
the guy on the ground said. I do now. You know the two things you really need to understand. What are they? Whoever you think you are, I'm tougher than you. And I am more ruthless than you. You have absolutely no idea. I am worse than your worst nightmare. Do you believe that? Yes. Really believe it? Like you believed in mom and apple pie? Yes. You know what I did to your buddies? Yes. What did I do? Do you finish them? Correct. But here's the thing, John. I am prepared to work with you to save your life. We can do this. If we track. But if you step half an inch out of line. I'll kill you and walk away. And I'll never think about you again. And I'll sleep like a baby the whole rest of my life. We clear on that? Yes. So do you want to try? Yes. Or are you thinking about some stupid move? Are you quarterbacking it right now? You planning to wait until my attention wanders? No. Good answer, John. Because my attention never wanders. Have you ever seen someone get shot? No. It's not like the movies, John. Big chunks of disgusting stuff come flying out. Even a flesh wound. You never really recover. Not a hundred percent. You get infections. You are weak and hurting forever. It's the thing. So stand up now. Risha got up out of his crotch and moved away. Pointing the gun, aiming it two-handed at arm's length for theatrical effect. Tracking the guy said, a big pale target. First the guy went fetal for a second. And then he gathered himself and got his hands under him. And jacked himself to his knees. See the yellow car. You're going to go stand next to the driver's door. The guy said okay and got to his feet. A little unsteady at first. Then firmer, taller, swerve. Feeling good now, John. Feeling brave, getting ready. Going to rush over and get me. No. Good answer, John. I'll put a double tap in you before you move the first muscle. Believe me, I've done it before. I used to get paid to do it. I'm very good at it. So move over to the yellow car and stand next to the driver's door. Reach attract him all the way around the Malibu hood. The driver's door was still open. Reach had left it that way for the sake of a speed exit. The guy stood in its angled. Risha aimed the gun across the roof of the car and opened the passenger door. The two men stood there, one on each side. Both doors open like little wings. Now, get in. The guy ducked and bent and slid into the seat. Risha backed off a step and aimed the gun down inside the car. A low trajectory, straight at the guy's hips and thighs. Don't touch the wheel. Don't touch the paddles. Don't put your seat belt on. The guy sat still, with his hands in his lap. Now close your door. The guy closed his door. Feeling heroic yet, John? No. Good answer, my friend. We can do this. Just remember, the Chevrolet Malibu is an okay mid-range product, especially for Detroit, but it doesn't accelerate for shit. Not like a bullet anyway. This gun of mine 
is full of 9mm parabellums. They come out of the barrel doing 900 miles an hour. Think of fall cylinder GM motor can after on that. No. Good, John. I'm glad to see all that education didn't go to waste. Then he looked up across the roof of the car, and he saw light in the mist to the south. A high camisticral glow, trembling a little. Bouncing, weakening, and strengthening, and weakening again. Very white, almost blue. The car coming north towards him, pretty fast, 